pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is the time for public comment. Members of the public are invited to address the authority regarding any item not listed on the agenda. Uh, please complete one of the speaker cards in advance of the meeting and hand it to the clerk of the board. Uh, do we have? I don't have any speaker cards. Do we have any speakers tonight? No, we do not. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item is uh, approval of minutes of July nineteenth, twenty seventeen. Moved. Second. Okay. okay, motion by Haskew, second by Romick. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Next item is the uh, consent calendar. You have a motion? Second. Okay. Um, we have a, a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. And now that brings us down to um, item 3B8, which we're going to take in two parts. And the first part is item 3B8.1. Certification of the final environmental impact report for the 2017 countywide comprehensive transportation plan by adoption of resolution 17 44 G, including approval of response to comments on the draft environmental impact report for the countywide comprehensive transportation plan. I assume we have a staff report. Yes, Mr. Chairman, good evening. Good evening, board members. And uh, I'm Martin Engelman with the Contra Costa Transportation Authority, Deputy Director for Planning, here to give you a presentation on the uh, process you're going to go through tonight to first certify the EIR and then adopt uh, the countywide plan. In your handout packet, you have uh, copies of the presentation uh, for your reference. So uh, you're all familiar with Measure C and Measure J, uh, and uh, the, that legislation requires that you develop and occasionally update a countywide transportation plan. And at this point, we have done four of those plans. The last one was adopted in 2009. A little bit of history about the timeline. This effort on the 2017 countywide plan began in 2012 when the Regional Transportation Planning Committees began updating their action plans. And we developed our first draft of the CTP and released a draft EIR on it in 2014. Following that release, we had an unprecedented community engagement program with more than 5,000 5, participants. In 2015, adoption of the final plan was postponed so that we could incorporate more of the comments received from those 5,000 participants. We started working on a second draft and a second EIR, and the, this new draft was developed to meet MTC's uh, CTP guidelines, which had actually changed in fall of 2014. In 2016, we worked on sending Measure X to the ballot, and following the November election, uh, the authority approved uh, planning staff's work plan for developing the 2017 CTP update. And that, count, that uh, uh, work plan had a schedule uh, that said we'd get it done in calendar year 2017. So here we are in September, and hopefully we'll get it done. Uh, the more detailed time frame where we are tonight or brings us to the point where we are tonight, we released the draft 2017 CTP on May 24th and launched the public engagement website on that same day. Uh, we released the draft EIR on June 16th and started the 45-day public review comment period. 
On June 29th, we held a countywide open house here at uh, the office next door, and it was very well attended. On August 1st, the uh, comment period closed on the CTP and the EIR. We received those comments, and we prepared responses to those comments, and those responses to comments were included in the PC packet and are in your uh, CCTA packet with regard to the EIR. The Technical Coordinating Committee met on uh, August 30th and approved uh, the, our responses to the comments and the changes to the final plan. The Planning Committee met on September 6th, and they uh, forwarded the plan to you for adoption today. The basis for the plan are uh, a forecast of uh, land use where Contra Costa County and all the jurisdictions therein would add uh, 88,600 new homes and 122,000 new jobs. And we use these numbers, put them into our travel demand forecasting model, and that computer model uh, is our crystal ball that tells us how things are going to be in the future. And we also include in that all of the transportation improvements that we expect, and we can get a pretty good picture of how the system will uh, be loaded up with traffic, cars, buses, uh, passengers on BART uh, in the year 2040, which is the uh, horizon year for the, for the plan. Just to give you uh, a reminder picture here of how this is done, it's a grounds up process. It starts at the local level. Each local jurisdiction sends a representative to their RTPCs. They worked on their action plans for routes of regional significance, which established performance measures for the major facilities in our county. And we developed then a draft countywide plan, which knits together those action plans, and there are five of them, West County, Central County, East County, La Mirinda, and the Tri-Valley Transportation Plan. Uh, we do our public outreach, and then we go to this final CTP and final EIR, which we're asking you to approve tonight, then the regional committees can go back and adopt their final action plans and do all of the actions, measures, and programs that they've committed to doing in order to meet their performance objectives. To formulate the plan and to be in compliance with MTC's uh, CTP guidelines, we developed some financial forecasts going out to the year 2040. Uh, the first column here is called the 10-year project list, project costs, um, and it is essentially the 2013 Regional Transportation Plan numbers brought up to 2017 dollars. A total of 3.67 billion will be invested in this county between now and 2040 based upon existing revenues from local regional, state, and federal sources. Uh, it doesn't assume SB1, and it does assume RM3, but it doesn't assume SB1, and there's some other uh, numbers floating around out there that we don't know whether the money's going to come in or not, and that's where we get to the column to the right, which is suppose we did get more funding. Suppose we did get, for example, another half-cent sales tax measure in Contra Costa. Suppose we got another... Um, gas tax change. In this case, SB1 would be in the right-hand column. Uh, a new measure for a house and sales tax would be in the right-hand column. We roughly estimated this by assuming the sales tax would bring in $2.15 billion, and we leverage it 2 to 1, and that gets us to the $6.45 billion. And that is the, the, the um, ceiling we use for our investment decisions in terms of what we can afford to build between now and 2040. Um, and so we're, we're selecting projects from a much bigger list to establish a 20-year project list. And uh, this is the Long Range Transportation Investment Program. I know this map is hard to see, but this, there are four maps in the plan, and they're on the wall here. And we tried to illustrate where um, the investments will be for the Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, for both highways and for transit and pedestrians and bicycles. And then we also do the same thing for the Long Range Transportation Investment Program. The major projects are listed on this slide. Uh, you can read through them on your handout. 
Um, these are the big ones, generally 100 million or more, that are included in this countywide transportation plan in our 20-year project list. And the left side is what's in the RTP, and the right side is what is in the longer-term funding package. So the process tonight is uh, two-step, as Chair Butt mentioned. First, to certify the EIR, um, to review the final EIR, to review the response to comments that we received on the draft, and um, to adopt Resolution 1744G. I'll take a moment to go through the EIR part, and then you can act on item uh, 3B 8.1. So here are all the impacts we analyzed. This is required by CEQA, um, and we covered them all for the countywide transportation plan, which is the project, and also for a number of alternatives that were required to evaluate under CEQA. Uh, the impacts come out to less than significant, uh, uh, less than significant, uh, mitigated to less than significance, um, and then there are impacts that we can't fully mitigate, um, and that those become significant impacts. We have to evaluate the cumulative environmental impacts of the project, that is the project along with all the other plans and programs expected between now and 2040, and CEQA requires that we evaluate the uh, projects within the plan to determine whether or not they have growth-inducing impacts. Uh, the impact criteria we used is listed here, and essentially we said that if there is uh, more than a 5% increase or decrease, depending on which criteria we're looking at, then that was considered to be a significant impact. CEQA requires that we evaluate alternatives, and the alternatives we developed in the EIR are first, alternative one, the no project. That assumes that we don't build anything between now and 2040 except for the projects that are under construction or already have completed their environmental review. Alternative two would be the RTP alternative, which is essentially just the 3.6 billion in projects and doesn't include the long-term uh, improvement pro program. And then the project, the CTP, is a geographically balanced multimodal long-range transportation investment program of projects, and that includes both the RTP and are uh, six plus billion in investments. So then we developed two more alternatives uh, to look at what would happen if we invested our money differently. What if we put all of our uh, funds into transit improvements? How would the system perform then? And then alternative, that's alternative three. Alternative four, um, suppose we didn't build that many highways or build that many BART extensions. Suppose we just spent the money on programs and programs for transit, bicycle, and pedestrian. What would happen then? So these, all of these alternatives were evaluated and weighed against each other. Uh, we're required to develop and identify an environmentally superior alternative. We do that. CEQA requires us to do that by law. And so we identify alternative four, the program alternative, as environmentally superior. But in the end, we decide that the project the CTP is what we want to adopt because it is the, the project, it is the alternative that accomplishes the authority's visions and goals. So this step now, uh, we're asking for you to take action to adopt Resolution 1744G, certifying a final EIR, certifying that it's been completed in compliance with California environmental law and it's been presented to you for review and consideration, and it reflects the independent judgment and analysis of the authority. I will mention that we did receive an additional comment letter uh, last Monday from Transdev, and that comment letter is in your handout packet along with our response, and I want to uh, take this moment to enter into the record uh, Transdev's comment letter and our written response uh, to that letter. So with that, um, you can go ahead and uh, discuss this item. Other questions from uh, commissioners? 
Okay. Uh, we have a speaker, uh, Debbie Toth. Well, it's 3, 3B 8.1. So we're on 8.1. I think she wants to talk on 8.2. So, next, okay, 8.2. Okay, are there any other speakers on this item? Um, any comments from uh, yeah. Mr. Arnold? Um, Martin, thank you for uh, the last part of your presentation there. I just wanted to follow up. Um, just out loud to make sure. Mala has looked at this, our EIR consultant on the individual who calls himself TransF. Um, both our responses, which were really well detailed um, from the July 17th letter, I think it was. Um, so by saying, since this letter is now received after the comments, and we're putting into the record, but it's actually not part of the um, um, the draft, ER, the, the draft ER responses. So what is it that we're, what are we trying to do here? And I just want to make sure there's no gray area on this because this, this person has a tendency to come after agencies for a variety of reasons. It, the, his letter, even though it came after the response to comment or the comments were due, would be automatically part of the record. And so we wanted to respond to it to make sure that all of our comments were included. So if there was any concerns, any litigation, the full record is going to be considered by a court, including our response. So we were just trying to do Excellent. all of our due diligence to protect the record and answer uh, the letter that we received at the last minute. Well done. Thank you. Martin, a really nice job in this. I'd be willing to move the item. Second. So I, uh, before we vote, so we have a motion by Arnrich and a second by Pierce. And, um, you know, I guess because of all the time and effort spent on all the bills in Sacramento and RM3 and that kind of thing, um, I didn't go through this to the degree I probably wanted to or in the time I wanted to, but um, uh, but I did try to get through it today, and there's an awful lot of information in here. Um, I think the, the EIR part of it, in, in a sense, is the easiest part because, um, I, and I've read all these, I've read all these letters, and most of them, uh, you know, from the Sierra Club and Transdef and so forth, most, most of them appear to be focus more on the countywide transportation plan and not the EIR. Um, you, you know, I think that what, I, I don't see anybody here to speak to criticize the EIR. And um, so um, I, I think that that's probably the easiest and safest part of this to, to address. So with that in mind, let's vote. All in favor? Do we need a do we need a uh, roll call? You do not. Okay. I heard a bunch of ayes. Are there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? Okay. Hearing none, uh, we will then move on to um, 3B8.2, which is approval of revisions to the draft 2017 countywide transportation plan. Approval of finding facts in support of findings, statement of overriding considerations, adoption of the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and adoption of the 2017 countywide comprehensive transportation plan by approval of resolution 17-45-G. So uh, go ahead, Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So continuing along now, we'll work on uh, 3B8.2. Essentially here, now that you've certified the final EIR, you can go ahead and adopt the final 27 CTP. Um, well, what's in the CTP document? It's a two-volume set. We've thinned it down quite a bit from years gone by. Uh, volume 1 includes an introduction talks about challenges, opportunities, vision, goals, and strategies. 
This has the investment program for that long-range transportation investment program we talked about. And also the last chapter is implementation. What are we going to do in the next four or five years to make this happen? Uh, volume two is uh, a summary of the action plans. The action plans themselves, you can see that notebook there uh, on the dais, uh, are quite a bit of paper. We haven't included these in volume two, but we have included a summary and the action plans are available on the website. There's also a performance assessment of uh, projects of 20 million or more that we did earlier and an equity analysis. And then there are the supplemental reports which include the EIR, the full action plans, uh, a PDA investment and growth strategy and analysis of our multimodal transportation service objectives and the countywide plan is also a reference document for the plan itself. So we are making some revisions to the draft. As you know, the draft went out and received, we received a number of comment letters. The PC Planning Committee reviewed those comment letters and approved uh, the changes uh, shown on this slide here. Um, I'll let you read through them. Uh, but essentially there are a couple of substantive changes, uh, primarily modifying the regional transportation uh, mitigation program to eliminate maintenance and transit as a allowable use. And then there are a number of technical corrections. We've worked quite a bit on the maps to get the labels right and revised uh, the 10 and 20 year project list to make it more accurate. So. With that, we're asking for your approval of the final 2017 CTP, uh, and that means adoption of Resolution 1745G. You're approving the revisions to the draft, which will make up the final. You're approving a fairly large document called Findings and Facts in Support of Findings, which is EIR related, goes through all the significant impacts we found, and uh, gives you an explanation of uh, why we think we should go ahead with the project, although there are some significant impacts. There's a statement of overriding considerations, which in one page summarizes um, your reasons for adopting the plan in view of the EIR. And then there's a required mitigation and monitoring and reporting program, uh, which you are also adopting. And that's where we go out and we find out how we're doing on these various uh, mitigations for the projects when the projects eventually go out to the project sponsors. So with that, we ask for your adoption of the final plan through adoption of Resolution 1745G. Are there, are there questions? Um, okay, I'll now call on uh, Debbie Toth. So good evening. Um, my name is Debbie Toth, and I am the uh, president and CEO of Choice in Aging. We are a nonprofit organization that's been around for 70 years, uh, helping people with disabilities and frail elders remain living in the community instead of in institutions. And I'm here tonight to um, thank you profusely and shamelessly for including a strategic plan for accessible transportation in this effort. As many of you know, that is the largest growing demographic in the population here in Contra Costa. Just to throw some numbers at you because I have a microphone, uh, over the next 40 years, the population that's aged 64 to 65 to 74 is going to grow by 125 percent. The population that is 75 to 84 is going to grow by 198 percent. And the population that is 85 and older is going to grow by 299%. Those numbers are from the California Department of Finance. It's no joke. We don't have adequate services to serve the population that we have today. And we need to do something better for our aging population. So I thank you profusely and shamelessly for your support of this endeavor. Comments from anyone? Um, I, I've got a couple of, of things. Can you summarize, and I, I couldn't find it in the documents, could you summarize the uh, overriding considerations? 
Yeah, the, the overriding considerations are um, in the planning packet. Uh, so we didn't want to reprint this. Uh, but in the planning packet, we included the full findings and uh, the overriding considerations. Um, it's a one-page document. <laughs> Here's what it looks like. And I can put it up on the screen if you'd like. But essentially, it's uh, saying we've reduced the adverse significant impacts of the project to the extent feasible. We're, we're adopting a mitigation and monitoring report um, that is, uh, becomes a part of the EIR. And uh, we've considered the entire administrative record on the project. We've weighed the benefits of the project against the unavoidable adverse impacts after mitigation. And we've determined that a number of factors, social, economic, environmental, will benefit from the project separately and individually, and that those benefits outweigh the unavoidable adverse impacts of the project itself. And the overriding considerations are that the project supports the efficient, safe, and reliable movement of people and goods. The project manages growth to sustain Contra Costa County's economy, preserve its environment, and support its communities. The project expands safe, convenient, and affordable alternatives to the single occupant vehicle. And the project maintains the transportation system. And it will also help us to continue to invest wisely to maximize the benefits of available funding, of available funding because it actually sets a path for how we should invest to maximize our benefits. And so then it's the final statement is, the authority hereby declares that the foregoing benefits provided to the public through the approval and implementation of the project outweigh the identified significant adverse environmental impacts of the project that cannot be mitigated. The authority finds that each of the project benefits separately and individually outweigh all of those unavoidable adverse economic, adverse environmental e effects identified in the EIR and therefore finds those impacts to be acceptable. Okay, thank you. Now, the, um, uh, one of the letters we got was from the Sierra Club, and uh, their first comment in here, again, it really addresses the, the plan and not necessarily the EIR, FEIR. Um, but it says the CTP should demonstrate that it adheres to the Guidelines for Countywide Transportation Plans, uh, parenthesis CTP guidelines, adopted by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in 2014. For instance, Plan Bay Area 2013 has two mandatory performance targets and several additional regional performance targets set out in Table 4, Chapter 1, page 19. One of these performance targets in the Transportation System Effectiveness category is to increase non-auto mode share uh, by 10 percentage points. Uh, and it references tables. Uh, in the 2017 EIR, it makes it absolutely clear the tra countywide transportation plan will not come close to hitting this target. And I, you know, I went in and I read the, I read the responses and I just couldn't understand it. I mean, it was, maybe you can explain it to me in everyday language. So how, how are we able to adopt a countywide transportation plan that misses the mark by 90%? Is that, is that explained by the, uh, by the uh, adoption of, of uh, overriding considerations? And, well, I, I'll, Go ahead and address that now. So I, I may want to turn to our uh, EIR consultant on this. Scott Gregory is here from Lanphier Gregory, and he, he did work on this question and the response. Um, and there, uh, there, there was some question at first as to how to interpret the, the MTC um, uh, uh, goal or target. Um, when they say a 10% increase, uh, in, uh, 
in transit ridership, are we talking about 10 percentage points or are we talking about a 10 percent increase? We've got a 10 percent increase in transit ridership, but it's not 10 10 it's not 10 points. It's going maybe from from 2.5 to 3.5, and that's a hefty increase more than 10 percent. But well, it says increase yeah. non auto mode share by 10 yeah. percentage points. Yeah. So. so so percentage points. We we did consult with MTC and we talked to a number of staff people there, and they confirmed that they had been around. Uh, they'd, they'd run around on this a few times themselves, and it is in fact 10 percentage points, which neither MTC nor our CTP achieve. And so we have clarified uh, in our response to comments that it is 10 percentage points, and we have not been able to achieve that, and nor has MTC and their RTP. And I, I turn to Scott Gregory if he'd like to add any further uh, detail on how we uh, responded to that comment. Well, I, I, I guess then that leads to my second question. That is, I think you just stated that, that in the uh, – Adoption of overriding considerations that that this plan included doing everything feasible to uh, to meet these goals, and one of the I would assume that one of the things that would be both feasible and would increase those goals would be uh, adoption of alternate four instead of instead of the preferred alternative. I, I don't know because I haven't delved into the details, but. So um, alternative four still doesn't meet that goal. Well, and that's but a very, how much does it increase it? Very little. Uh, it's, you're talking about tenths of a percent change in, in the uh, uh, non-auto usage, not 10 points. But so we're ten, talking about tenths, but I could, I could pull out the table. A fraction of a percent? A fraction of a percent, yeah. I, can, I could pull out the table. And, Tell you what it is, but the alternative four doesn't doesn't come close to ten percentage points. The RTP doesn't come close. It's a very ambitious goal. You're talking about going from seven percent non-auto to seventeen percent, something like that, which is more than you know doubling. So we, we no one's been able to get there yet, and I think you'd have to probably take some really drastic measures to make auto usage much more costly and, and much more time consuming in order for it to get that level of, uh, of transfer over to non-auto. And you'd also have to expand the transit system significantly. Does your consultant want to comment on this at all? Maybe you can help, help uh, give me a comfort level here that I frankly don't have. <laughs> Sure. So good evening, members of the board. My name is Scott Gregory. I'm an environmental consultant for the project. Um, we did answer this question from the Sierra Club as part of the environmental review as their letter was, was uh, indicated as being part of the EIR. Um, the MTC performance target of 10 percent was established early in the MTC's planning process. They went through their regional transportation plan process did as many things as they could to try to meet their targets and realized that they met they they achieved a four percent increase in in their performance target. So they did not meet their own target as part of the regional plan and recognized. But you said but they got four per, a four percentage points increase? They got a four percentage points increase. And our plan is a fraction of a percentage point. So you, you had asked about some specific numbers. I did pull together a few quick numbers. Um, with regards to transit trips within within the county, um, generally today, so based on our uh, based on the traffic modeling that we did and calibrated it to 2000, 2017 levels, there's about 113,000 transit trips that occur on a daily basis within the county. Under the project, that number of county that number of transit trips under the transportation investment program, that number of transit trips would increase to approximately 150,000 uh, trips. Now. Relative, 157,000. There we go. Went from 113 to 157,000 transit trips. So it's a substantial increase in transit trips of about 44,000 transit trips in just in real terms. That's a lot more than 10 percentage points. So it's when you're looking at at overall tra overall transportation trips, mm -hmm. the total amounts of, of 
trips within the county is going to be substantial because it's that that number represents uh, approximately, gosh, the total number of non SOV trips, so non single occupancy mm -hmm. vehicle trips, is only about 42 percent of all trips. So we have a substantial increase in total trips that's going along with that substantial increase in transit trips. So when you when you're looking at the comparison between how many transit trips do we have, how many vehicle trips do we have? We're starting at a very high number, and even though we're adding a substantial increment of additional improvements, the, the added increment is a small number relative to our starting base. And so that's why that's why we have only a, you know about a one to two percent increase in, in transit trips. You had asked you had asked a question about comparing to um, alternative alternative three, the four alternative to alternative four. Yeah. So in comparison to the to the project, we have 157,000 transit trips under the project, 161,000 transit trips under the um, alternative four. It's about a three percent increase over the project relative to just relative to what the project's increase is. So there is there is an increase, but that's again three percent compared of the total trip transit trips as compared to the project. Total number of all countywide trips, including single occupancy vehicles, all the people in their cars, all the other modes of transit, it's a small increment compared to the existing yeah. baseline. Well, I guess it just seems to me like that that it's it's almost shocking that we're adopting this long term plan and it has you know, has almost no effect on our sustainability goals. And I mean, that's something that's really important. Why are we doing it? What's the point? In any event, I sense nobody else has any questions like this. So, yes, uh, Commissioner Trotter. No, thank you, uh, Chairman Butt. Um, I may not have the same questions as you. Um, I did want to ask some questions about the form of this, the statement of overriding considerations. And I don't know whether this should be addressed to Martin or Scott or our attorney. Um, I look at this statement and it's very general um, and um, I mean the generality of it concerns me. I mean you would think that a statement would have to say yes we find these things to be benefits but it doesn't necessarily then reference back to specific aspects of the plan that are supposed to, to um, uh, result in these benefits and I wonder whether it's too general and whether that might be something that needs to be beefed up. Who wants to take that? I think I'm going to ask my colleague Allison Martinez, who worked heavily on the CEQA document from our office, to respond. Good evening. Um, in response, the uh, statement of overriding considerations is sufficient under. CEQA requirements. That's what we're looking at for uh, what the document uh, needs to meet in terms of requirements. Um, I was trying to find the code section just now to uh, read it back to you, but um, this document has gone through our office and it's a, a standard type of uh, statement of overriding consideration that we find. Acceptable. So you don't have a you don't have a situation like the Topanga case where. You have to, you know, cite your findings and then have evidence that supports findings and things like that. Well, that's part of the findings that uh, you also will be adopting with this. So, um, statement of overriding considerations is just one component okay. of this um, larger item, and, and your findings are there, and they do cite back to the uh, the EIR documents. And it's your advice to us that the statement of overriding considerations doesn't have to reference back to specific findings and facts in support of the findings that also support the statement of overriding considerations? Yes, this is sufficient. As it That's is. your opinion legally. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Comments? Any further comments? Yeah. I, I would make a comment, and, and unless there's objection, I would also make a motion. Um, I just want to thank the staff for your perseverance and your patience 
and your um, never-ending faith that we could actually get this done. It has been a slog, to put it mildly. It has been a test of everyone's endurance. It has been um, a major effort. And the last time we did this, it seems like it was a whole lot easier than this time. Um, but we got it done, and I think we are all the better for it. Uh, all of the delays considered, I think it's been one of the best jobs we've ever done. Certainly the outreach was stellar. Um, we set a very high bar for the entire Bay Area in doing public outreach. Um, many of our colleagues have now followed our lead in how to do that kind of outreach and interaction, both electronically and in person, um, using all possible vehicles for that. So I just want to congratulate the staff and all of us for, for getting through to the end and uh, a job well done. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just had a comment, I mean, and to echo Julie's, uh, to thank you. This is uh, this is much much more difficult, um, and part of it is is because the rules are different. SB three seventy five, AB thirty two came came into play, um, and those are important things. And I think that addresses what Tom's uh, concern is. But we are a transportation planning agency. We not only plan, we build. So. That's our goal and desire. So high-level view, what we're doing is saying this is our plan. We then have to pause and go through an environmental process to determine are we headed the right way. And we might have individual, well, I'd like to lean this way. It's a fairly objective process. It allows people, you know, we have a mantra and our mission is set by the taxpayers, they told us what we're supposed to do. We're carrying out that promise. So while this process is complicated, it's testing us in our preposition that this is what we're going to do and here's how we're going to achieve it. It has actually, through the process, changed some of those things to make sure that we are achieving all of those goals, all the new ones that they've given us that weren't voted on by our taxpayers, but we must adhere to. So while it um, um, seems different than what we're all used to seeing um, in our own jurisdictions when we create a policy or an ordinance, you know, we have findings and stuff. Obviously, the next item we're going to do on here are the findings, but we have to do these in order in order to establish the ultimate last one we're going to do, which is to adopt this. So it's just that we're looking at vignettes of these things. So um, it is a awfully drawn out process and frustrating at times, but I think it allows the public to give us input to check and balance, and for those who want us to lean a different way, we have done that according to those rules, but we still have a mission, and the, the good thing is, it's like when you plan anything as an architect or a planner, which I am, it's kind of nice that it's actually going to look like what we thought it was, but it's going to be a little bit better because of the process, and to staff and Mala and um, our um, environmental team that's helped us get there, this is really well done, and I'd second the motion. Okay, so I was told by staff that we did not have to vote on items one through four, only item five, which incorporates all of the others. And I, I want to echo what, um, uh, what the two of you just said, that I, I think staff has done an outstanding job. I think clearly um, you've satisfied the um, objectives of all the commissioners and presumably, if they represent the people of Contra Costa, you've done that. But having said that, um, I'm still not comfortable with it. Uh, there's an opportunity to delay action till October the 4th, and I, I would be willing to take it, some more looks at this and vote on it on the 4th. But we have a motion on the floor, and um, let's just call the vote. Do we need a roll call vote on this? I'll second that. No. We do not. Second what? No, it's been moved and seconded. So uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, I'm going to abstain. Okay. So for the record, that was 10-1 with Chair Butt abstaining. Yes. And, I'm sorry, 10-0-1. Yes. Okay, next uh, item, I guess, is item 
1.A.12, Gomentum Station and Shared Autonomous Vehicle Updates. Good evening, Chair Brett and Commissioners. My name is Jack Hall, and I'm the CCTA Intelligent Transportation Systems Connected and Autonomous Vehicle Program Manager. This evening, I'm going to give you an update on the Gomentum Station Program and our Shared Autonomous Vehicle Project. So we have four overarching goals for the Gomentum Station Program, and they are to create smart jobs in Contra Costa, improve mobility for everyone, enhance safety, and improve the environment. Concerning safety, we have a Vision Zero goal. No more traffic fatalities because connected vehicles won't be able to hit each other. First, here's a quick recap of Gomentum Station. It's the closed Concord Naval Weapons Station where we have a license with the City of Concord and the U.S. Navy to test autonomous vehicles. This is a large area, approximately one-fifth the size of San Francisco. This photo was taken in the area we call Bunker City and is where Honda and Uber Freight are currently testing. We are planning on improving the roadways in this area to, collect, to include three and four lane road sections which will, which will provide partners with additional uh, testing conditions. These two pictured 1400 foot tunnels go under State Route 4 and are a feature that no other proving ground in the U.S. and likely in the world have anything to compare to. They are ideal for testing sensors, and most potential partners get very excited and check their phone connections when we travel through them. In this photo, Randy usually mentions that the bridge columns are not protected by guardrail. This is a non-standard condition, and autonomous vehicles need to be ready for all conditions, including the cracked pavement shown here in non-standard designs. This photo was taken in the admin or urban area and will be turned over to the county in the future. Baidu is testing in this area, and Honda is interested in doing a second demonstration here. We are working with roadside equipment vendors to install their latest traffic signal equipment for testing the, with autonomous vehicles. This installation will provide us with vehicle-to-infrastructure testing. This is Gomentum Station's vision statement, to build a CV AV center where convergence, innovation, and commercialization of CV applications and AV technologies take place in the largest test bed in the world. We have testing occurring today, including freight testing. And I can say, um, and I can say since the APC meeting earlier this month, we have gotten a lot closer to achieving this complete vision. This is a team effort, and with everybody working together under the leadership of Randy and Tim, we are making tremendous project in, in achieving our goals. We feel that we are redefining mobility and we are, going to be able, we are not going to be able to build our way out of congestion. New technology is going to improve our quality of life and allow all citizens to access, access to efficient transportation. This slide depicts the macro environment that we are working in. Influencers, challenges, applications, and technology. Our program director, Habib Shamskow, keeps an eye on the big picture as others, like myself, continue working on day-to-day -day operations and working with new partners. This slide depicts the general categories of who we work with. Original equipment manufacturers, those are the car manufacturers. Tier one suppliers, those are parts suppliers. Roadside equipment vendors, public agencies, technology and communication firms, insurance carriers, analytics, research institutes, other test beds, and professional organizations. Each group brings something to the table and it's fascinating to see the plan all coming together. We have a global presence in the autonomous vehicle sector. As an example, today Mr. Swenson from Volvo Truck in Sweden toured the Proving Grounds. One of the more promising partnerships is with the Netherlands, as they are planning on bringing companies to Contra Costa to open uh, to, for U.S. operations. This slide shows our current key partners, and it will be growing. Honda is bringing their third generation car to test in the October-November time frame. The car in the back is our generation one car, and in the, in the front car is our generation two car. You can see how the sensors are getting smaller. These cars are both Acros, and the new gen three car will be a Honda. 
Uber Freight is another great partner, and we see the trucking industry as one of the first adapters, adopters of autonomous vehicle technology. Thanks to Randy, we are seeking a large amount of federal funding tied to testing freight vehicles, and I'll ask him to comment on that later on. Baidu is the Google of China. They are the ramping up testing of their Apollo autonomous driving program at, at Gomentum. So we just saw some of our current partners who are testing at the Proving Grounds. However, Gomentum Station is more than just the Proving Grounds. It is a comprehensive program. Other projects include Integrated Dynamic Transit Operation System, the State Route 4 ICM, TDM 511, Mobility as a Service, Smart Corridors, Innovate 680, and the Shared Autonomous Vehicle Project that I'm going to talk about more later. The benefits of the program tie back to our overarching goals, improving mobility and safety, creating jobs, helping to improve the environment, and while we are doing it, Contra Costa is gaining national and international recognition. We want to work with STEM programs for local students, and we are working to educate the public on this new technology. Momentum Station is a 501c3 with developed bylaws, and the board is currently being formed. The amount of tasks is quite large, and we have one part-time contract employee, Claire Donovan, right now. We are working with Concord and the Contra Costa County for a longer-term commitment, which will help partners feel more comfortable when they sign up for longer-term commitments. CCTA and Gomentum executed an MOU last November, and we are planning on bringing an updated MOU to the board this November. Our most notable project is our Easy Mile Shared Autonomous Vehicle Project. This project is a public-private partnership. The left side lists our private partners, Stantec, Easy Mile, Best Mile. They work on the route optimization and come get me application. First, First Transit, they're the operator, and Bishop Ranch. On the right side are the public partners, CCTA, BART, Bay Area Air Quality District, County Connection, SFTA, and LAFTA. So we are on schedule and currently testing at Bishop Ranch Phase 2. Phase 1 testing began, began at Gomentum Station last summer. Currently we are doing Phase 2A testing in the parking lot at Bishop Ranch. Phase 2B testing at Bishop Ranch will include public roads. We are working with Leader Pelosi, who in turn is working with Secretary Chow to obtain a NHTSA waiver to run these vehicles on public streets. And here I'm going to ask Randy if he could comment a little bit on the update on the. Thank you, Jack. So we, we've been in contact with Robert Edmondson, who is Leader Pelosi's Chief of Staff in Washington, D.C. Met with him numerous times. The latest meeting, we had a phone call. He asked about our request for a waiver. And we couldn't decide who should ask for the waiver to the, the weight limit and the speed and, and the production rate that they set up for golf carts because our vehicle's too heavy. And so finally, we, we took the bull by the horns, and we actually crafted a letter, signed it, sent it off to, to NHTSA for a waiver. We sent that copy of that letter to Robert Edmondson, the chief of staff. He contacted apparently his boss because his boss went over um, from the Capitol into the NHTSA or the secretary's office and, and suggested that we get our waiver. And so after that meeting on a Friday, I got a call from Jeff Giuseppe, who is the associate administrator for NHTSA and said we should get an answer. That was last week, so we haven't got that answer this week either. Um, but hopefully it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a positive response. If it's a positive response, we take that letter saying we have a waiver and we go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and we get a permit to operate this vehicle within the confines of Assembly Bill 1592, which allows exempts us from the steering wheel, brake pedal, and an operator, but it also requires us to have a, an attendant on board for secu personal security perspective if the vehicle has to be moved and other things manually, and also a wireless connection to a comm center. And we've, we've agreed to all this in that legislation. And so I think we're getting closer to being able to be the first entity in, in the United States, maybe in North America, to run a fully autonomous, uh, no driver, no steering wheel, no brake pedal vehicle to provide that, hopefully, ultimately, that first and last mile connection between transit and, and um your, your house, which will get you, Chairman, Chair Butt, to where you want to be, and that is 10% more people riding in transit. And it'll address uh, Debbie Toast's issue about the aging population. We'll be able to put people 
in another mode of transportation, they'll still have mobility even though they, they have other issues. They can't walk as fast or as far and those kinds of things. So we're excited. Yes, very excited. Very excited. Thank you, Randy. That's perfect. <clears throat> and phase three testing consists of running at least 97 of these vehicles around transit centers in Contra Costa. If we didn't like, so like Randy says, if we didn't have a schedule, you can almost guarantee we wouldn't get the shared autonomous vehicles on the street. So this has never been done before, but this is the schedule that we we're planning on achieving. Here are the financials and budget for Gomentum Station. We are growing year over year. Years 2015 and 2016 are all private funding, and 2017 shows some state funding. Highlights on this slide include holding three global summits, and in January we are designated as one of 10 US DOT automated vehicle proving grounds. And here are some recent accomplishments. We've secured 3.5 million from the state. We've signed new partners, Toyota and SAIC. They're the largest car manufacturer in China and, and most likely the largest manufacturer in the world. We're very close to signing new partners, LAFTA and County Connection. And then Randy, I mentioned how we have auto or Uber freight testing. Maybe Randy, can you talk a little bit more about that $100 million FUD appropriation? So as you know, we have one of the, probably one of the better federal lobbyists that works with us, Jason Tai, who has connections throughout the Hill. And we worked hard on language that ultimately Congressman DeSaunier carried and was able to place in that FUD bill through an omnibus bill. And it, it specifically states that there's $100 million available. It's currently in law. It's, it hasn't been, I don't think it's been passed, has it, Jason? By the House. By the House. So it's still, it's still in, in, the language is still there. But it's $100 million available for one of the, or more of the 10 designated test sites in the United States by the United States Department of Transportation. And you have to be testing freight. So we have Uber freight. And so it exempts some of the other maybe less developed test centers in other parts of the country out east that aren't testing freight or testing yet. And so, you know, I, 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 we're not greedy. We'll just take half and we'll leave the other half for the other nine test centers. But that, that's really, and so thanks to uh, Jason and thanks to Congressman DeSani and Congressman Sol Swalwell and, and Congressman McNerney and others for sponsoring that bill. So thank you with that. Um, we're happy to answer any questions. Questions? Yes. Well, could you go back to the budget uh, slide? Okay. Are you just rounding off because 2.7 million minus 2 million is 700,000. So what am I missing there? Oh, so, oh you're adding that across. Well, it's okay, but it, it looks like the reserve for futures is the 137,000. It just doesn't look right, I guess. The math is working. Yeah, so the million oh five nine eight is the seven the two point seven minus two million that leaves seven hundred plus the previous low column which is three fifty nine gives a one oh five. Okay. If you're gonna make this part of a dog and pony show, I, I think it needs a little cleaning up is my point. You have to read it twice to see what you're right. Okay, well taken. <laughs> Um, I had a quick question. Uh, so, uh, Randy, it's my sense that this is sort of transitioning from a geographic-based program. I mean, from a from a geogra from a place-based mm -hmm. operation to a program-based operation. It's got you've got the Concord Naval Weapons Station site. You've got Bishop Ranch. You've got the potential to expand into. Uh, other parts of Contra Costa County is that and that that's the way it's going, right? Yes, sir. So, in your case, so, so Gomorrah Station is not it's not a place anymore. It's a yes, it's exactly. A program. It's, a, it's a program that attracts startup companies to large OEMs to come and and test not only at Gomentum Station but in Contra Costa County. Right. So the other company that came in this morning again is a company called Train Foads. I didn't know if it was try info or train info, but basically they put sensors and measured delay at cross arms at railroad crossings. So when this young young man approached me, I was I was giving a speech somewhere, and I'm half Canadian, half Japanese, half Hawaiian. I said that like five times yesterday at ITS. But this kid's a Canadian company, and he said you deployed 
Bliss Synergies studies the interaction between bicycles, pedestrians, and cars, and that's the most that's increased the most in the fatality rate percentage-wise in the United States. We're back up to 40,000 fatalities in the United States. The, the biggest percentage increases are bicycles and pedestrians, so we're very concerned about that. But tra Trainfo, they have a, that measuring device. I called Chairman Butt, Mayor Butt and said, hey, we've got this device that will measure delay at your railroad crossings in your city. He says, let's do it. Bill Lindsay said the same thing. They're going to test their, their technology at, at Gomentum Station, which will help us with our freight application but also it's going to help you with your delay. That company is based out of somewhere in Saskatchewan or somewhere back <laughs> on that side, and they came, they're coming to Richmond in the United States for the first time, for the first time in the United States. And it's a big attractor of technologies that may help so save lives or make our transportation system more efficient or make that connection between the intermodal connections even better. And that we're, we're, I mean, we're really excited by, by that whole process. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that it might be worth looking at, at trying to rebrand this a little bit because it, it, it kind of comes off as a place. You know, you've got those slides. We've got, we've got long roads. We've got underpasses. We've got parking lots. But there's also a lot of buildings out there, right, and intersections. Yes. And then, and then if Bishop Ranch is a part of this, that's a whole other thing. And then if you've got the opportunity to expand this into, you know, first and last mile and bar, I mean, it, it just seems like that in terms of selling it that you ought to pull all that stuff in and make it all part of the picture instead of emphasizing so much what's at, at Concord. But anyway. Great. No, that's a great point. And Lindsay's, I think Lindsay's still here. She's, the, she's a master at this, and she's worked very hard, and we will come back to you in the near future. Maybe with we have a, a slide deck that talks about our innovation program, yeah. which Gomentum is a small part of, a major part. Right. That's the attraction. But yeah. all these companies that are investing in Contra Costa County to make our transportation system more efficient. We have another proposal. It's a company, I'll just say now, SPIN. So yeah. SPIN is, is a basically, rather than have – a bike share program, Pleasant Hill to Pleasanton with bike racks. These place bicycles randomly throughout the city of Walnut Creek. And I have a proposal for the city of Walnut Creek because they want to deploy it in Walnut Creek or in Concord or another major large city. It could be Richmond. These are GPS enabled, and, and they, they, they're, they're willing to for, they'll sign all the waivers. They'll provide the insurance. They want a chance to deploy their technology in Contra Costa County. Why is that? Because they think that you all are, are pretty darn innovative, and you, I mean, that's really at yeah. the end of the day, they're not going to a, a county that says no all the time because they don't have time. Well, I mean, another reason I bring this up is that that um, other companies, perhaps our com competitors, are you know they're testing these things in San Jose and you know other places like that, and so um, I, I, it seems like if that you want to make sure that people understand that we can provide all of that. They want to, they want to test it out in a place where nobody's around and they can, they can really take chances. Then we've got that. If they want to test it in an office park setting, we've got that. If they want to <coughs> test it in Richmond, you know, we'll, we can, we can figure that out. <laughs> you know, you're letting them test live. A pilot project yeah. on your railroad, and they're not in railroad right away, so they s put the sensors outside the right away and measure the delay. Yeah. And you're you're letting them all Yatter is doing is making sure mm -hmm. they have power to their sensors, and they'll provide the rest of the information to you because it's the it's the one of the pilot projects for free of charge. I mean, it's, it's a great deal. Okay, very good. Anybody else? Can I make one comment? Um, this is great, and. Uh, Federal and I met with Randy and Jack and other staff members about this and the county's participation. Um, I was just responding to something here. Uh, as you may know, the city of Concord is putting in, as is everybody else in the world, for the Amazon headquarters. And um, they're finalizing the package. And I'm just thinking that maybe the lure of an autonomous vehicle testing site might help. So I might be checking in with you tomorrow for a brief paragraph because sure. this has got to be in on Friday. But uh, maybe it's the thing that uh, might send us over the top. Okay, next item, correspondence and communications. Are there any comments on that? 
Hearing none, um, associated committee reports. Are there any committee reports? Hearing none, commissioner and staff comments. Commissioners, anybody have comments? Staff? I have three comments. Well, actually, I have four comments. When I got hired seven, year, seven and a half years ago, I was told that the month of August was a dead month, no <laughs> meetings. <laughs> No, no, nothing to do. Clean out your desk. Your, your, all your papers can be thrown away. You can reflect on the year and, ha and you know, reset for the next, next 11 months. Well, that, that really hasn't happened. That has not happened in a while. And so that's one issue I wanted to bring up. The autonomous vehicles in, in numerous meetings, a lot of partners. There's partners that we haven't talked about that we've signed, and Lindsay will work, and, and Jack and Habib will work with the entities to get nice press releases out because that helps us with these other firms that want to do business because they come here because it's, it seems like it's easier to deploy their technology. And so why fight to deploy when you can go somewhere where they, they welcome you with open arms? The second, the third thing is planning. So we've been harping on, and this kind of goes to your, your question, Chair, Chair Butt. I have asked our team to figure out ways of incorporating technology in our update of our plans and then model against those benefits. And consultants are not used to doing that. And so we're pushing our consultants in the positive direction of changing the way they model the future. And so when I was at a, a conference, and Martin gave me this number, so I blame Martin, but we're changing the capacity of a freeway by the year 2040. It's not going to be 2,000 vehicles per lane per hour. We think it's going to be 3,300 vehicles per lane per hour. So I said that in a speech at the Transportation Research Board. State DOT people stood up and said, he just said a number. And so we got in kind of a mini argument in, in this panel session. And I said, my number is going to be closer to reality in 2040 than your number because cars will follow closer, they won't hit each other, and there will be a lot of changes in the way we approach the future. The other thing we're looking at in California, because we still buy into this climate change, is we've modeled zero emission fleet Turnover. So as the fleet grows with zero emission vehicles, whether it's fuel cell or some other technology in the future, we think we can reach 80% uh, reduction in greenhouse gases. So I was at an event speaking, and I was at lunch, and there was a, kind of a famous professor at the University of Purdue. He was walking through the conference room, and he saw me, and he yells out, hey, there's 3,300. And so I said, thanks, appreciate that. And everybody's going, yeah, you gave out a number. Well, I said, somebody's, some, an entity has to push this ball forward to change the way we model the future. And so in here, we've been invited to a number of meetings now to talk about how federal highways needs to change their planning processes. And so people are listening to, to what we've said. And I'm not saying our number's perfect. All I'm saying is that the plan and when you model the future, you're modeling trends. And I, I think our trend line is going to be better and if we can find ways of moving people, incentivizing people in other modes of transportation, like Peter's effort with paying an incentive to use a, um, an app like Scoop to incentivize carpooling, we're going to pay $2 on a, on a, a temporary basis, 15, up to 15,000 rides. I got chastised in, in the, on a LinkedIn post, and the guy says, you should have spent that on paving. Well, it's $75 a ton and uh, 144 pounds per cubic foot. We could do like 1,000, 2,000 feet. Of a, of a one inch overlay. So that's not very much in the overall scheme of things yet. If we can move 15,000 people into another mode of transportation or a carpool and they like it, that's going to eliminate some of that waste and make our system more efficient. So planning is changing. And then RM3, we went through this RM3 process this, this month. And, uh, you know, we're probably not exactly where, where all of you want to be, but I think we're better off than when we started. And so we spent a lot of time in Sacramento and, and I, I we are where we are, but we spend a lot of time in Sacramento. And there's some things. I think we got a well-rounded list of projects. We're, we're trying to finish the McCollumy overhead there at, down in East County. We're trying to fund this Vasco Road project so we can get that safety project underway. So there's a lot of, I think, a lot of good things. They're just probably not enough. But there's really not enough money to do all the transportation projects in California that we need. So those are my comments. Thank you. And. Uh, any and questions? Before we go, I, I want to thank um, Randy and I want to thank the uh, CCTA staff and particularly uh, Amy and Julie for um, working on the RM3 SB 595 issue so far so hard over the last couple of months. 
And uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think largely due to their help and assistance, we were able to get uh, the east approach to the Richmond Sanderfield Bridge into the bill. And uh, I would also like to note that my, um, I guess you could read this different ways, but uh, my assembly member, Tony Thurman, was the swing vote on passing that. It passed out by one vote in the assembly, right? So I'll, ta I'll take credit the, for that. There you go. Can, um, <laughs> thank you for your kind words, Mr. Chair, and also the, we had uh, Commissioner Glover, too, to that list right, of uh, yeah, commissioners okay. that did not have a quiet August. <laughs> if, I, if I missed anybody else, I apologize. You can you can uh, come on in. But uh, that was... Uh, that was a real uh, that was a real Herculean effort and a squeaker, but it came through. So now all we got to do is pass it, right? It's up to the voters. Uh, you know, it, well, once it goes on the ballot, it will be up to the voters. Yes, um, we have, according to the bill, until the end of 2020 to put it on the ballot by this authorization. I, I would recommend to you that one of the things we need to talk about, perhaps at our next meeting as things kind of settle down a little bit, is what our guidance would be to MTC on how this goes about being implemented at the commission level. Um, and I will just leave this comment out there for you to ponder between now and the next time we have a meeting so we can discuss it. I would just suggest to you that we might likely want to recommend that this be phased in and not done as an all-in-one shot deal, mm. but if we really want it to pass. So that's for another discussion. Good point. Okay, anyone else? Going once, going twice, we're adjourned.